Well, hello and welcome back, everybody, to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John, and this is episode 218. Welcome back. Uh, it's always nice to have you. Remember, this is a question-driven podcast. So if you have questions, send them to podcast at DanJohnUniversity.com. Do my best and brightest to answer them each and every week. I'm just in from track practice. It was a windy, hot day. Uh, and it was wonderful, so I hope I don't look too sun-bleached and sunburned, but uh, let's do this. Uh, our first question is from Andy. Andy starts off brilliantly, okay? What he says is this. Firstly, I'm a big fan of your work. Love the new book. Also found it answers any questions I had from reading the first Easy Strength. See, I like that kind of thing, yeah, where they give me a lot of praise, and I, I appreciate that. Okay, uh, a little humor, ha <laughs> ha. I'm currently recovering from a full Achilles tendon rupture. Oof, that, I got to tell you, I, I feel for you, Andy, and I've had a few friends get that injury, uh, one from playing racquetball, and, and, and it was just like a funny movement and pop. It sounded like a gun going off. It's, it's a rough one to recover from. And I've been doing some uh, easy kettlebell uh, work to ease me back into lifting. I, I like that idea. My question is, what exercise program would you recommend that focuses on glute hypertrophy and strength? There's a family of exercises that I think are wonderful for glute building. Um, it's interesting with your with your Achilles tendon injury uh, that that you want glute strength, and, and I applaud that because I think you're right. Um, back okay, so back squats. I would prefer high bar, a little more vertical. If you can do front squats, even better. Now I know you asked. You asked uh, for kettlebells. I'll get there. So the barbell back squat, probably the front squat's better, but we're not going to worry about it today. Um, the hip thrust, it, the hip thrust with the barbell. I personally, I use uh, those big Dynamax bands, but the hip thrust is amazing. So the squat and the hip thrust. There are a couple of other uh, uh, styles. Like I know for some people. Now this this is where the I like. I was about to go into the deadlift family, but. The deadlift family does expose the issues with humanity. We're all built just different enough. Some people get great glute work out of the uh, sumo deadlift, wide leg, kind of narrow hands to summarize. I personally get a lot of good, uh, good out of the uh, Romanian deadlift. I also do the deficit deadlift where your feet are up just a little bit and you drop the kettlebell in between. Uh, they're really like doing a... It's almost, if, if done correctly, it can almost be a perfect hinge for some people. Uh, again, your mileage may vary. Now, why did I start with that? Because with the glutes, uh, those big barbell exercises work, uh, hill sprints work, sprinting works. When you get to the kettlebell, the issue is going to be this, is that a lot of people, they, when they start doing the glute work with the kettlebell, they go too light and, and they... They go too light and they try to, to ramp it up with a lot of volume. So the best exercises for glute development. Now, if you can swing well on paper, and I don't know where this magic piece of paper is, but I think, I think the kettlebell swing is an outstanding glute exercise done correctly. I don't know if you can handle or have heavier loads. Uh, I will say this, uh, if you've ever done two-handed swings with the 48 and you really hit them 10 to 15 reps with the it's the 48 weighs 106 pounds you'll know you'll know your glutes are the next day uh we do have a little program we do at the gym now the other exercise and i talk about it way too much on the podcast is a double kettlebell front squat i do think if you can make it so that you work in uh loops it, it's going to um, uh Circuits is going to go really well for you. This is a classic circuit in our gym. So you do a set of hip thrusts. Now, whatever, whether you do a barbell, some people say that you, you can put a weight on your belly and do hip thrusts with a kettlebell. Uh, I personally don't like that. I've tried it. I don't like it. I have uh, Brett's, uh, Brett Contreras's hip thrust machine. I have the big one in my gym, and then I have the L-I-T-E, the light version, over here in my family room because... You know, every family room should have a hip thrust machine. Uh, so you would go to a hard set of hip thrusts, so 25 or so, pop up, 
and do the double kettlebell front squat or the goblet squat if that's better for you as soon as you can so that your the glutes are already started to work and now the quads kick in as what we used to call a you know, kind of a pre-exhaustion after that so hip thrust squat step over and swing and use the ballistic to kick in and if you do have a, a, a glute loop or even mini bands after that pop down do clamshells to exhaustion you won't need much load if you do that so those four exercises back to back to back are my favorite way to work the glutes in most gym settings uh hip thrust 20 25 good reps double kettlebell front squat goblet squat eight to ten good reps kettlebell swings 15 and then um, clamshells to failure it's a good workout you really will feel the heat burning and i'll tell you this from the heart do just two rounds for the first few times you do it i i, I imagine you can build up to three four or five rounds of this but i'd rather you focus as always on the quality of those movements rather than the quantity so can you build glutes with kettlebells yes if you have good kettlebell swing technique, if you're willing to do those, those, which I think is one of the roughest exercises uh, for reps, the double kettlebell front squat, it does amazing things for your athletic ability because you just have to be so wound up. Yeah, you know, we call it anaconda strength, but you know, if you know what I'm saying. And of course you got the hip thrust, which is one of the, which is an amazing isolation. And then the clamshell at the end is an amazing isolation. As you know, when I travel, if you listen to this, I always bring a glute loop with me so I can do hip thrusts and clamshells when I get to the hotel room to kind of undo the damage of the flight. Uh, great question, Andy. I hope it helps. Uh, if you were to do that circuit and then like half kneeling presses after it, well, or just do my perfect workout, because I mean, most of the perfect workouts have already been said, but that circuit of the four exercises, the hip thrust, the squat, the swing clamshell do that two three four five times and then uh do half kneeling presses because that's going to stretch uh, stretch that hip flexor too i mean that that's not bad and uh, throw in a couple hangs and pull-ups or whatever and you got a you got a solid workout so thank you andy good question our next question is from warren and this is a question i i've seen before i don't like Warren says this, I'm reading Mass Made Simple and I'm interesting, interested in doing a six week cycle. Can you recommend a squat alternative to the barbell back squat? Uh, no, um, uh, it, the whole program fails if you don't back squat. Uh, there was a criticism some guy wrote on Amazon that uh, the elite bodybuilders do leg presses to build their legs. Uh, that's not what Tom Platts has said over and over and over in the last few years. Uh, he basically says that Tom Platt's the Golden Eagle, one of the greatest bodybuilders of all time, renowned for his thighs. Uh, it, he's real clear. You know, it's, it's high weight, high rep back squats is the answer to all your prayers. Uh, maybe you have an answer uh, to this. You know, maybe I, I worry people are going to send in things, but Mass Made Simple is a do this program. It, it I expect you to do this. Uh, if you start varying things, then it's not mass made simple. Having said that, everybody, everyone has issues. Uh, we tried doing it with goblet squats. We called it lean made simple, and it was it was a disaster. Uh, you could try it with double kettlebell front squats, though. I mean, if you're going to do a set of fifty in the double kettlebell front squat. If you do anything that involves collision, you're gonna be a tough person to deal with because holding on like this for a set of 50 reps is gonna be illuminating. I can remember doing, the, when I first started doing high rep back squats and having the bar there, I had the ability to lock out and just breathe. And yeah, the load was still on me, the load was still crushing me, but I could breathe. And that's why I was able to do things like I, I, and everyone listens know this workout, but one time I did 315 pounds in the back squat, deep, by the way, not the nonsense you see online, Olympic style, for 30 reps, 275 for 30 reps, and 225 for 30 reps. I got to tell you, I, I don't ever remember feeling that terrible. Um, 
<laughs> Dick Notmeyer and I not long ago. And he's 95. He still remembers the story. I was holding on to the, uh, we had this red uh, Naga Hyde uh, incline bench. Oh, pardon me, it was pink. Uh, my home one was red. And I was holding on to it to figure out how I was going to ride my motorcycle home that night. And uh, I made it home, but uh, I, it was, it was brutal. Um, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure there's other things you can do, but for this workout, it's the back squat. The complexes in the back squat are the foundation, the bench press, the, the, the single arm presses, the bird dogs, and the bat wings, those are just to, you know, to keep everything else yeah, balanced. Um, you know, it's like studying tragedies and comedies and skipping Shakespeare. I mean, it's just, it's, uh, it's, there's a gap if you don't do it. Uh, I'd like to have known why you can't do back squat, but that's the best I can think of. I imagine if you do have a, a, a belt squat, that the hip belt squat, that might be pretty good. In fact, it might be really good, but you're gonna to have to up the reps because you're not gonna get the hit on the upper body you do with back squats. Thank you, Warren. Great question, I guess. Um, when I give you a do this program, uh, do this, okay? Thanks. Um, Jonathan asked a question. For those lifters that have a good amount of experience and want to play our training more by ear, how would you approach your workout each day? What would be your mindset? What questions would you ask yourself each day? Is there a method of training in this way in your view? Well, I've never made it work, but I was having a conversation with somebody about the, the late, great Dave Draper, and Dave just loved being in the gym. And uh, even though he had organized routines, sometimes he just went by what he felt like doing. Now I know the Joe Weider uh, instinctive principle comes in, but Jonathan, you did say something interesting, it's important. You said an experienced person comes in. Uh, what happens when people just do this kind of thing, usually, is for men, we just morph into doing bench press and arm work. Uh, for women, we tend to morph into doing ab work and stretching. Uh, you, you have to have some kind of, you have to have some kind of uh, lane. You gotta have some kind of bumper that keeps you doing things that you might not want to do. Uh, I never feel like squatting. I mean, even when I'm getting ready for an Olympic lifting meet, that's, I don't ever roll out of bed and say, today is a great day to, you know, do a bunch of front squats and get really tired. Uh, so I, I build front squats in. Uh, I do them right after I clean and jerk, and it's just, it's just that's what I do. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say on this is that at some level, you got to make sure you hit if you just want to keep with my push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded carry. Um, I love loaded carries every day. I think they're fine. Um, on loaded carries, you get, there's, there's a lot of variations. You can just play around with what you feel like. And I think on loaded carries, that would be okay. On hinges, you know, let's just say you have, you have, you have the whole buffet of kettlebells, dumbbells, barbells, and all the rest uh, at your disposal. You know, and with hinges, uh, boy, if you feel like doing a hip hip thrust day one day, and a, two days later you feel like doing a deadlift day, I think you're fine uh, as long as you have enough tools. Um, I would like to see a squat at least twice a week. I think that's a nice number. You can get away with squatting once a week, um, but it has to be it has to be a hard squat workout. Let's just stick with two. There's not a lot of variations in the squat: goblet squat, front squat overhead squat, back squat, and then there's zercher, but not many people like or do zerchers. So if you're gonna do that, I would suggest just making sure that at every time you come into the gym, do the goblet squat as part of your warm up and try, try to not miss that. And then we get the pushes and pulls and I've yet to meet an American who doesn't do, do enough pushing. Uh, I would hope your instincts would tell you to do more pulling. I hope your instincts would tell you to do more uh, hinges and squats. Uh, it's a fun question. Um, this instinctive training, what you said, uh, uh, training more by ear, uh, shows up a lot. And I think I can do it. Uh, I have a good, I have a good group of people I train with every day. So if I was to walk in 
it would be a couple of weeks before somebody would say, if I was walking the gym and say, what do you want to do? And we would have a good workout. And I would say that five days a week, what do you want to do? Because of the way we have trainers, we have, you know, professionals of all different kinds. Uh, we have a lot of trainers in the last few months. I think people would begin to say, you know, let's make sure we get this or that in the workout. If you have a training partner, someone you can rely on uh, as not just your ear, but your, or your, your, your own personal instincts, but to someone just to be around going, yeah, it's great. You're training instinctively, but you know, you're, all you're doing is bench press and curls. Uh, just, just a wise voice in the wind to help you out. So yeah, I like your, I, I like what you're saying here. Uh, just, just make sure you have, you step back every once in a while and say, yeah, I haven't squatted in seven years, you know, or whatever it is. Fun question, Jonathan. Thank you. Very fun. Uh, Ryan. What do you think would be the drawbacks, if uh, if any, of focusing almost exclusively on the power snatch and power clean for an extended amount of time? Obviously, we all know the benefits of the power lifts and full Olympic lifts, but I mostly hear the quick lifts discussed only as accessories to the big lifts. Uh, maybe you do now, but 40 years ago, power cleans, I mean, there was entire training programs that looked like all they did was power clean. Uh, there was a famous Russian weightlifting coach that said, you must do many power cleans and back squats to succeed. Um, in the Olympic lifts, they've gone away from that. Uh, but I got to tell you, in a lot of other things, sports and just general, there's still probably some good advice for a lot of things. Um, I can't imagine someone being weak once those numbers start creeping up, and if you add an overhead or front squat from time to time and maybe do some presses and or pull-ups, why not make the power variations the main lifts? Is it the lack of time under tension when you take out the squatting pattern, the lighter weights? Um, Ryan, I, I like this question because you, you, you really do remind me of what a lot of throwers have moved to. Uh, and I've even suggested, yeah, I hate to say it, but you might have been in on the phone call. I suggested to a, a, a Highland Game athlete to just do power snatch and power clean because the per this particular person had a background, you know, high school bodybuilding, whatever that means in high school. And then, uh, after that, he, he, he got into powerlifting, not competitively, but at the gym, the big three lifts. And then when he went into uh, Highland Games, he had... You know, he had some hypertrophy from the high school bodybuilding. He had he had some hypertrophy in base strength, but he didn't have the snap you need to really get those implements to fly. So power snatch and power clean, uh, which don't beat up a lot of people. Done correctly, they don't beat up a lot of people. Uh, a buddy of mine, uh, his, his nickname is Pizza Steve, uh, really good thrower, collegiate thrower, really national level thrower. Uh, he even got away as a shot putter from doing uh, the turnover. So his workouts were snatch high pull, but high, high pull. And not just a little shrug, but, you know, getting it up to his chin. And uh, high, high power clean up to basically about, you know, sternum height. Um, and he said that he felt fresh. He never got injured. Uh, he felt good. He also threw far. But he also said something interesting, too, because, you know, now he's a doctor, is that it, he felt that he could get more reps faster than his buddies who are doing the full lifts. So he could get his workout. You know, if you're doing I don't know, five sets of eight in the snatch high pull, uh, you can get in and get out pretty quickly. 40 snatches is going to take you a while uh, just for the recovery. And it's also going to take you a while to recover. Uh, and I mean recover like from workouts. So I like your idea. I, 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 I don't know. If you try it, try it. Why don't you just try just those two lifts? Give it two or three weeks, three workouts uh, a week, two, three weeks, six to nine sessions, and just stop and then, you know, fold your arms and go, hmm, did that have, how do I feel? How, you know, how, how, how do I move? And then assess from there. And if you say, I really need more presses, well, okay, there's the, there's the gap in that program. 
I need more squats. There's the gap. But as I've discovered a few times in my career, when you when you take the Olympic lift seriously, you, you don't really have a lot of gaps. Somebody asked me why I stopped bench pressing, and, I, and I, my point was to be an elite level um, discus thrower, international level, you need about a 400 pound bench press. Well, what I noticed is I could clean it. I could clean 400. And then when I used the, 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 the racks, I could easily jerk 400. Well, why did I need to lay on my back? And I mean, I could easily bench it. So I dropped benches out of my program. My shoulders felt better. And I dropped a few other things. When I dropped things out, I feel better, feel better, feel better. Again, getting back to the question we had previous, if you're experienced, you don't need to do as many things. It's because the, the load is so high as you do less and less things at a high level. The downside is, you know, long term, uh, those high loads are, you know, they, they, they beat you up. Uh, ideally, uh, just the soft tissues of the body, you know, tendons and ligaments start to go, joints start to go, uh, things start to break off. So I, I like your idea. I do. <laughs> but uh, try it and get back to me. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Good question. Michael, you recently stated in the wandering weights that a classic method of progression was to work up to an ugly single using a particular weight, then watch, well, uh, yeah, you make, you make the lift with the single, yeah. Then watch the reps and the mass slowly build up. Um, boy, I hope I didn't say it like that, but the idea is the traditional programs, um, I've got a whole bunch of the books here in, in the library. Uh, if I was doing something like uh, and even a curl, even a curl, even a basic curl, is I would get up to a weight 135 pounds because my bar, I only have 135 pounds and I get it for a single. And then two, three weeks later, I get it for two. Two or three months later, I get it for five. A year from now, I get it for 12. Um, that is progressive resistance exercise. And you can get very strong doing that. And of course, back in the day, people only had one non-adjustable weight. Um, I've, I've still had a conversation in Island Pond, Vermont with a guy who got a big truck axle. Um, his dad, his dad found it and he trained on a truck axle that probably weighed 75 pounds for his training all through high school. It was a large rusty piece of iron. He cleaned it. He pressed it. He curled it. He did what he thought was a squat. He did what he thought was a deadlift. I'm just quoting and uh, he loved it and he got, and of course, when, when he went, went to school, they had a York barbell and he started, you know, to progress from there. So since you, okay, since you teach that squats don't progress well with easy strength, I have a lot of chapters on it, on the book, easy strength on book. It's at danjohnuniversity.com slash bookstore. Uh, I really don't want to go down that rabbit hole again of discussing why squats don't work. Some people have made them work, but, you know, read the, <laughs> I quoted Dean Martin today. Uh, Dean Martin was a great singer and he would sing just a few lines from a song and at a concert, someone would say, finish the song. And he'd say, buy the album, you know? So, hey, buy the album, you know? I was considering applying this concept with front squats, either kettlebell or barbell to an easy strength program. Do you think that the Russian fighter program progression would work for this purpose? And just how sore do you think this would likely get someone? Uh, also, let's, say, let's also would a slow circuit with the same volume of chins or dips or both make sense? So he wants to do front squats, chins, dips, then front squat, chins, dips, front squat, chins, dips. Would that work? Yeah, I think it would. In fact, I think I answered something like that about a week ago. This seems like a decent way to ease into hypertrophy rep ranges, not to mention getting friendly with my mortal enemy squats. Okay, so the fighter program is this. Let's just say it works best with if you can do five reps. Uh, either five reps with just your body weight, uh, which sadly is the, the number I use. Folks, I was not put on this earth to do pull-ups. I'll tell you that from the heart. But for some of you, maybe you put a... You put on a vest, you put, you know, you dangle weights, uh, you, you hook a kettlebell on your foot, you, 
um, you know, any, any way you can add load. So your max is five. And on day one, you do, um, real, we'll, we'll just make it as simple as I can. Your max is five. On day one, you do a single, a single, a single, a single, a single. Day two, you come back and you go double, single, 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 single. Day three, double, double, single, single, single. And when you get to all five doubles, you then go triple, double, 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 double. There's other ways to do it. Just I'm just trying to get through this fast. When you get through all the triples, you can go four, 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 four. Uh, when we get to the fives, you'd go five, 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 five. You would take three to five days off and just test your max. Um, you can you can do this program three to five times a week. Is this a good program? Yeah, it is a it is a style uh, that's been around a long time. Um, we would probably when I was young, we did this for higher numbers, but it is the concept where you just come in and you just grease that reps. You just get those reps in, boom, 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 boom. Uh, and at the end, you you smile and you whatever. Here's So here's what your first workout's going to look like, man. So you're going to do front squat uh, a, one, uh, a chin for one, a dip for one, and then you're going to repeat that five times. That's not very much. And you might, when you finish the workout, kind of look in the mirror and say, who am I? That was way too easy. Don't judge any workout by day one. You are, and I tell this to people all the time. If I give you three sets of eight and you get done with set number two, two sets of eight, and you say, well, that was easy. Uh, when I do three sets of eight, we insist on an exact one minute rest. I go, don't judge it yet. Get that third set. Of course, in the third set, you know, they're sweating and they're dying. Don't judge this until you go through the whole cycle. Uh, and remember one thing that's important. When you do that five, 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 the five, five day, you just take off three to five days. You can even take off up to a week and then test yourself coming back. And that's the most important thing I think on this is that test when you come back. Um, I don't know uh, of anybody who's researched this. I don't know of any studies defending it, but I do know this. It's a good idea. And if you have the courage to get through it, I think Michael, you're going to find this to be a pretty good program. Uh, good luck. And thank you. Would you please get back to me on that? Thank you. Uh, Sean asks a question. As far as modern posture programs go, I have it. Slump shoulders, forward head, wing scapula, oh, anterior pelvic tilt, tight lower back, weak core, tight and painful flexors. Well, Sean, I love you. And I got to tell you this. You are the norm. I fly a lot. I see a lot of people. I travel a lot. I know there's that one group of people who say it's, per, you know, that Yonda and all them were wrong. And it's like, oh, come on. Just, just, just look and you can see. So I'm here to help you. Okay. I've recently purchased a stand up desk. So I p spend less time sitting. Okay. That's a good start. Hats off to you. I'm also been walking to work once or twice a week, about two miles. Good. Where would you focus your time and where have you seen people make real improvements in posture? Okay, you're doing two things that I think is already right. First off, you're standing up more, which I think is good for everybody. Second is that you're walking and I think walking is number one. I'm gonna just share who I think you should ask this question of. His name is Tim Anderson, Original Strength. Now, if you're a member of Dan John University, Tim shared one of his most precious documents with us, um, Pressing Reset, which is his, I think it's marvelous. Uh, also too, if you read uh, my latest books, you'll see my post-deployment program, my hypertrophy program, hypertrophy and mobility program, and you'll see Tim's uh, work in there. Uh, Tim takes us back to being a child, to being a baby, in fact. So the number one thing, and this, this is a big thing for me too, Sean, is uh, he's gonna have you do certain things like prone position. You're gonna lay on your belly, you're gonna stick your elbows in the ground, you're gonna arch up. But the thing is, he's gonna want, you, uh, I'm laying on the ground. He's gonna want your eyes on the horizon. So what happens with most people, they get in that position, and when they go to raise their head, they can't get through. So calm down, it's okay, turn off the engines, and we're, we're going to take a few weeks, months, decades to get back. So 
one of the things that, so one of the exercises for a lot of people's necks is just neck nods. So you, you, you know, you look terrible in the picture. Uh, some people call it what? Burrito your neck. So you go like this and you drop it down. You bring it back up. You stretch it. You lean back and you just take your time. When I'm doing that right there in real time, I can feel little cricks and cracks and things like that. Another one we're going to have you do, eyes are again on the horizon, and we're going to lead with our eyes. And well, in pro, when we say find your shoes, you're going to do six point. That's when you're on your hands, uh, knees, and feet. You're going to do things called rocking. Uh, there's rolling. There's, uh, boy, I tell you, we were doing bear crawls at the cert, uh, at the cert this last weekend, and I forgot how amazing bear crawls were, even though I've been coaching them for years. Um, and then the other thing that really helped me is when we get to gate, which is walking, which is what you're doing. He, um, we sometimes in track and field call them a skips, but for me, since I've got some long-term injuries, some titanium and stuff, jogging and sprinting, I don't always get a lot of benefit from it because it really, uh, the physics just don't work well. Um, but I can a skip. And so my great eight sprints now are a skips and it, I, I, I love it. So my answer, uh, how to fix modern posture issues is to, um, look up original strength by Tim Anderson or danjohnuniversity.com. It's in the downloads, uh, get pressing reset. Um, I, that's what I did this last weekend as I'm in real time, as I'm speaking, uh, I know this won't come out for a little bit, but in real times I'm speaking about halfway through the weekend, uh, I, I realized that, uh, you know, as much as I love the Olympic lifts and front squats and all the rest, I also need to make sure I do my, uh, my prone work, my six point walk, my rolling, my a skips. I need to get back into courting my body turning my body back to the way it's supposed to be and not from all the travel. That's a, that's a great question. And I hope, I hope it helped you help me help you. Yeah. Is this our last question? Zach asks, do you think it's valuable for a kettlebell general fitness enthusiast to pursue, pursue the RKC as uh, standards as a goal or challenge in and of itself? Or the other side of it, preparing and passing a cert requires a dedicated mm -hmm, and consistent application and practice to succeed. And cert prep would almost in any case improve overall fitness. Oh yeah. Body comp and general health, all good things for the regular Joe. I'm a 41 year old male with a busy career, two kids, seven and four, with the normal suite of family life obligations. I enjoy kettlebell training and skill development I'm currently focused on improving my body composition, but struggle with consistency. I tend to do well with big goals and even a little better when there's money on the line. That is putting up the cost of a cert. Is it worthwhile for the normal guy to get certified? Zach, um, I'm getting more and more people who come to the certs auditing the course. And I really like that idea. Um, you know, I mean, for you, Zach, and we're just, let's just, Let's just pretend that you have to do the snatch test. Uh, so that's 100, 100 snatches with the 24 and 5 minutes. Infinitely doable. A lot of work to get yourself ready. Is there value to it? Oh, yeah. I mean, there is something magical about kettlebell snatches. Um, uh, I want you to press the 24 for 5 reps, 24 for 5 reps. Is there value to doing that? Yeah, it's it's a standard. Um if you look around on my site or any of my books, uh, I, the, the original blog post was called Sleepless in Seattle because I was in Seattle and I, I, I could barely stay awake. Um, and so I wrote this blog post because I don't even remember why I did it. Uh, but I have all kinds of numbers and standards. The, the problem I ha would have with the, the kettlebell certification standards, their certification standards that so here well i can't put my hands low enough to what we expect from a normal person anymore this is what we expect a kettlebell certified instructor to be able to do that's the minimum okay obviously many of us are well above that um 
but you're kind of, it seems to me, you're in that other, that, that little uh, area underneath that used to be called the ether, but we know that the ether doesn't really, isn't really true. But, you know, here's a normal person, you know, below the carpet, below the floor. Uh, here's you, and then here's that minimum standard. Anything you do here to, to rise up, touch, or exceed the minimum standard, I think would, I think would have value. I mean, for a man, being able to press the 24 for five reps, a good standard. Uh, being able to do the double kettlebell front squat, double 24s, five to 10 reps, that's, that's good. Being able to do a Turkish get up with a 24 is pretty good. I mean, it's an impressive, you know, I, when we do the certs and someone, you know, stands up at the 24, you know, it's obvious how much shoulder and body control they have. And when they put the weight down, it's also obvious that uh, something as simple as a Turkish getup can be a whole body exercise. And I'm talking cardiovascular. So yeah, I do like that. I do like the standards. Having said that, just attempting to get them sounds like a good idea to me. So thank you, Zach, for the question. I like it. My thought is then to get back to it. I love standards. I really do. I like standards. The thing I always try to remind people of, once you hit that minimum standard, you know, uh, uh, Brett Jones said it so well when we got certified, congratulations, you're now the least competent in, uh, instructor we have in our system because you're brand new. I, I thought that was kind of funny. And it's true. It was, a, it was a nice warning. So working your way up to those standards, and since you don't have to do a, a, in, a, in a weekend, you know, maybe you want to try chase one standard, get it find another one, chase that, and enjoy. Enjoy the process. You're 41, you got kids, you got a life. Um, maybe you can't do everything at once, but pick and choose a few things, and I think it'll be good for you. Well, there you go, gentle listeners. Uh, if you have questions, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. Uh, I'm here to answer each and every one. I sure appreciate your question. Sure appreciate your question. Uh, I do. Um, today's questions were a nice mix, um, I, but I did notice it was a lot of kettlebell stuff. Uh, I, I like questions uh, on all ranges of things. And just remember, if you have questions, you send them to me and I'll take good care of you. And until next time, let's all keep on lifting and learning.